Well, welcome everybody to the latest edition of Stars, Cells, and God. My name is Fuzz Rana. I am a biochemist and a Christian apologist, and I work for an organization called Reasons to Believe. And I'm joined today by Dr. Hugh Ross, who's an astrophysicist, an astronomer, and also the founder and president of Reasons to Believe, which is the organization that uh, sponsors uh, this particular uh, broadcast. Uh, uh, Hugh, uh, this is uh, exciting for us because we get to hang out together and talk about some of the latest discoveries in science and what those discoveries mean for the Christian faith. Uh, But if people want to know more about how science and faith work together and, and our perspective on science faith issues, they need to go to our website, reasons.org, uh, where, where they can find out, again, all kinds of, of information 20, about... 20,000 articles and yes, counting. <laughs> and, and all kinds of videos. And a lot of this is available at no cost to the people that are going right. to our website. And then also, we would want people to follow us on a social media. RTB underscore official is the easiest way to, to gain access to our social media posts. And then, of course, we would invite people that are watching this to subscribe to our YouTube channel, our Reasons to Believe YouTube channel, and then also set a reminder so that each time an episode of Star, Cells, and God is posted, you'll be notified. And they can subscribe for free, right? No yes. charge. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Subscriptions are, are free. So we, we're giving away a lot of good stuff, uh, but, but there's a good reason for doing that. Uh, today, we're going to be talking, each of us, about... a. Uh, Uh, some discoveries. Uh, You're going to be talking about uh, some uh, geochemistry, and and I'm going to be talking about chimp behavior. So uh, why don't we go ahead and get started? Uh, Hugh, why don't you lead us off uh, with your discovery? Well, this is a paper that got published a few weeks ago in Earth and Planetary Science Letters. I mean, this is the paper right here, and uh, you can uh, go to the website and uh, you can actually access the entire paper for free. This is one paper they said, hey, we want everybody to be aware mm-hmm. of it. So uh, not just the abstract, the whole paper. Uh, but it's a paper about some measurements on a mineral called bridgmanite. And a lot of people haven't heard of bridgmanite. It's actually the most common mineral in the interior of the earth. Mm. So, and uh, it goes by the name of uh, you know silicate perovskite. Uh, You know, silicate is just silicon with three oxygen atoms attached. And uh, if it's magnesium or iron uh, that's attached to the silicate, uh, we call it bridgmanite. Mm -hmm. And the name comes from Percy Bridgman. Uh, He's a physicist that won the Nobel Prize in 1946, being the first physicist to actually look at crystals and subject them to the pressures Mm -hmm. that we have at the deep interior of the earth and see how these minerals behave. So he was awarded a Nobel Prize for that. Uh, But this paper basically is doing something similar to what Percy Bridgman did. Mm -hmm. Uh, They're taking a single crystal of Bridgmanite and subjecting it to the kinds of temperatures and pressures you see at the deep interior of the Earth. In fact, what they did is they subjected it to the pressures and temperatures. You see what's called the core mantle boundary. And we got a slide here that shows that, the core mantle boundary. This shows the core of the Earth. It's got a solid inner core, a liquid outer core, and then outside that liquid outer core is what we call Earth's mantle. Mm -hmm. And that's where most of the interior stuff of the Earth is. The mantle is the biggest component of the interior of the Earth. Uh, But this slide also shows you how since we've got a solid core of uh, mainly iron, nickel, and cobalt Mm -hmm. and some other lighter elements, surrounded by a liquid core of the same kind of material, you get convection currents Mm -hmm. circulating uh, throughout. Because what's happening is you've got minerals being released from the solid core into the inner core, and they move out to the mantle, and it's that movement that generates Mm -hmm. uh, these convection currents. And when you've got uh, iron and nickel and cobalt, those are ferrous metals, when you've got them circulating, it sets up a dynamo. Mm -hmm. That's where we get our magnetic field from. And so there's this big magnetosphere that surrounds the Earth, all thanks to the interior of the Earth uh, being structured uh, this way. And that's a pretty unusual property, right? There's no other uh, solid planet in our solar system that has a magnetosphere or uh, a liquid core 
Well, the moon did uh, mm -hmm. very early in its history. In fact, that was at a time when the Earth and the moon were close enough together that the two magnetospheres coupled. Oh, interesting. And that's actually crucial. If that didn't happen, Earth would have lost all of its atmosphere and all of its water. Ah. But the moon being much smaller than the Earth, uh, its core cooled a lot more rapidly. And so by four billion years ago, uh, the core had cooled enough where you no longer had that circulating uh, material, and so it lost its magnetic field. So is uh, the core of our planet cooling as well? It's cooling as yeah. well, and that's what this whole paper is all about. Ah. It's basically measuring the conductivity, the heat conductivity of Bridgmanite. And uh, what made this paper so exciting, I mean, it went all over the web, a lot of popular articles came out, uh, is that they discovered that the heat conductivity of Bridgmanite was 50% greater than what previous measurements indicated. Mm. And this would be under the intense temperatures and pressures of, right. the, of, the, of the core. So it's basically telling us uh, that the Earth's core is cooling faster than what we thought mm. uh, by a factor of 50%, because bridgemite's the most common mineral in the mantle, so this would have the dominant effect of uh, the cooling of the interior of the Earth. That doesn't sound like good news. Well, it's not good news if you're wanting to plan your investment portfolio out for the next billion years. <laughs> it's basically telling us that probably a little less than a billion years, we're going to lose our magnetic field. Mm -hmm. And more than that, it's going to affect the tectonics. Because the same process you see in the interior of the Earth, the energy flow from the inner core through the outer core into the mantle and the crust, this is what drives plate tectonics. Mm -hmm. And that's crucial to recycle the nutrients that all life needs. So it's a process of continents being built and being eroded mm -hmm. and being rebuilt that circulates the nutrients uh, throughout the ecosystem that keeps life going. And so this is basically telling us, hey, with a cooling 50% faster, it's going to be sooner when we lose both our magnetosphere and the plate tectonics. And actually helps us understand what happened to the moon because, uh, you know, I wrote an article on this coupled magnetosphere a few mm -hmm. months ago, and the mystery is, why did the moon lose its magnetic field so early in its history? Well, if we got Bridgmanite with mm -hmm. a high conductivity, higher than we thought, that kind of explains how by four billion years ago, the moon had lost its magnetic field. Because the assumption is that the, the, th there would also have been Bridgmanite at the, the mantle core boundary in the moon. Right. Yeah, bridge, we see bridgmanite in meteorites. It's a common mineral. Mm. Oh, so we basically understand all rocky planets are going to have huge quantities of bridgmanite. Okay. And so, yeah, we'd expect the moon uh, to be like that. Um, and, uh, I mean, as I read this paper, it's like, wow, what a miracle it is that the Earth hasn't cooled off already mm. to where we've lost our magnetosphere uh, and uh, our plate tectonics. So the bottom line from a Christian perspective, this is enhancing the fine-tuning argument. Mm -hmm. It's basically saying, hey, with Bridgmanite having this high of a conductivity, it's far more challenging to have a planet with a strong magnetosphere and strong mm -hmm. plate tectonics four and a half billion years after its formation. And actually, you need to have special circumstances given the high conductivity of Bridgmanite to have it last even 4.5 billion years. And uh, the next slide kind of shows you uh, why we have so much initial heat in the interior of the Earth. Mm. Number one, our planet uh, formed as a result of a collision between two planets. Our solar system actually began with five rocky planets, and uh, the fifth one is Theia. And early in the Earth's history, less than 100 million years after it formed, uh, Thea and the proto-Earth had a collision event, although some refer to it as a merging event because mm -hmm. the two bodies uh, had a soft collision and basically merged. And that required kind of a just right uh, approach of the two planets at their just right angle, right? Had to happen at just the right angle and just the right velocity because uh, otherwise you could have wound up destroying the Earth. And it was also fortunate the Earth at that time had an extremely deep ocean. Mm more than a thousand miles deep. And so that helped to uh, make it more of a merger than mm -hmm. a collision. 
So the proto-earth wound up getting more mass, and uh, the debris that fell out from the collision event formed the moon. And if it wasn't for the moon forming, we wouldn't be here now. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was important, but it also meant that we have a much higher heat of formation for the Earth and the other rocky planets. Mm. You're probably aware Mars doesn't have a magnetic field anymore, neither does Venus, neither does Mercury. They all lost it a long time ago. And that really should have been then the fate for the proto That would have been a fate for the Earth. But the fact that uh, had this collision event, which basically enormously boosted up the formation heat, so that made the interior of the Earth a lot hotter than it otherwise would be. And then the other thing is that this collision event, along with several other events that I don't have time to talk about, super enriched the interior of the Earth with long-lived radioisotopes. Mm. And that's the third uh, visual we got here. Basically, it shows a graph of a potassium-40, uranium-238, thorium-232, and uh, uranium-235. These are all long-lived radioisotopes. They release heat when they radioactively decay. And the dotted line there just shows you the heat release, uh, heat flow uh, from these radioactive uh, isotopes in the interior of the Earth. And it's a combination of the huge abundance. And to put this in context, Earth compared to other rocky planets in the universe has got 630 times as much thorium mm. and 340 times as much uranium. So we're actually living on the uranium-thorium champion of the universe. But that means our planet has way more interior heat than you'd expect in any other rocky planet. And then that merger event also boosts the heat up which explains why we still have a magnetic field today and we still have plate tectonics. And yes, uh, things don't look good in the future, given the high conductivity of Bridgmanite. I'd say, hey, I wouldn't plan any investments beyond half a billion years, because uh, by that time, we know for sure uh, Bridgmanite is going to cause the interior to cool enough where it might not eliminate our magnetic field, that's going to make it very weak. But even the loss of tectonic activity is going to be catastrophic. Oh, yes. So it's really a double whammy. So it's a double whammy. Uh, but it just makes the whole point. We live on an amazingly fine-tuned planet. Yeah. It's been designed. And, you know, people say, well, why couldn't God have put us here earlier than four and a half billion years? Well, the sun doesn't really stabilize sufficiently uh, for human civilization until it's four and a half billion years old. Yeah. So we need design that's going to sustain this magnetosphere uh, and uh, this uh, plate tectonics uh, until the sun reaches that stable point. Mm -hmm. And so this Bridgmanite discovery is basically telling us, wow, the Earth is way more fine-tuned in its design than we thought previously. Yeah, that's pretty remarkable. You know, one of the things that, that I find interesting is you know, your concern, and, and I would share that concern too, that, that tectonic activity could one day come to an end because that's almost what some skeptics want, right? You know, one of the, the, the complaints that you hear from skeptics is why would God create a world where there's tectonic activity that leads to tsunamis and earthquakes? That Volcanoes, cause, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that cause so much, you know, natural disasters and so much pain and suffering as a result of that. But, you know, what you're emphasizing here is that, you know, without tectonic activity, we would be living on a lifeless planet. So you don't want to necessarily get what you are asking for, right? Well, for example, when there's a big volcanic eruption on a large island, uh, the inhabitants uh, vacate, but they come back. You know why they come back? Because all that volcanic ash gives you super rich soils in which you can really grow a lot of crops. And with the Ice Age cycle, you get volcanic eruptions all over the world when the ice retreats. Well, those volcanic eruptions have fertilized all the great plains of our planet. We wouldn't be able to feed billions of people on planet Earth today if it wasn't for the aggressive plate tectonics that allows for this worldwide volcanic eruption episode to happen at the end of every ice age. Mm -hmm. So tectonics, that's just one of the real benefits of tectonics. Yeah. So I'm grateful for earthquakes and tsunamis, and, and they're all at the optimal level. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. Although well, next know, time I feel one here, I may not feel that way. <laughs> yeah, well, but, you know, the thing is, is that, you know, you and I live in Southern California where there is a, an imminent threat of a, a major earthquake. Right. You know, and, and you don't want to minimize the pain and suffering that people experience in natural calamities. But at some point, we do own responsibility, right? We do. I mean, if, if our, my house is destroyed by an earthquake and I pray to God that it isn't, you know, is it is it really God's fault or is it my fault or am I complicit, at least to some degree, in, in living near the San Andreas fault, right? Or, or if, you know... Well, I like that passage that, uh, that you see in the Gospels where Jesus says, do not build your house on sand, build it on the rock. You know, and how that plays out here in, in California is we've got building codes right. that take into account, hey, you know, earthquakes happen. And so our, our homes are built in such a way that they can withstand a nearby magnitude 7 earthquake. Yeah. Well, you know, I, uh, I wrote a blog article several years ago about a study that was published in Nature conducted by uh, some engineers, civil engineers, and they were noting that we have made incredible advances in, in tech, building technology that allows, you know, high rises to withstand earthquakes. And the question was why, if all this technology is available, has the last decade or so been the deadliest in terms of the loss of life from earthquakes. And th so they looked for a number of different factors that might explain it beyond building technology. And interestingly enough, the number one factor that seemed to contribute to, to destruction and death from earthquakes was governmental corruption. Yes. You know, and so it, it really indicates that there is a strong moral evil that that is that is contributing to it's more expensive to build a home where all these uh, building requirements are in place so yeah right. if you want to make more profit right. uh, just cut a few corners but when you do that uh, you get people losing their lives you know and of course you know time of day you know makes a difference in terms of destruction and loss of life as does you know poverty levels in the country but what was interesting is it wasn't poverty it was actually corruption that seemed to be the number one contributor to to death and destruction so you know god is has given us the the wherewithal you know providentially i think to to withstand natural disasters you know another interesting example is you know the loss of property and, and life from hurricanes well it used to be in the united states nobody would build uh structures on the coast because they understood that the risks of doing that and it's only been in the last you know, century or so that, that people have found that real estate to be valuable. And so, you know, again, we're, we're doing things that, that are unwise. Yeah. Putting your aged parents in a mobile home on an East facing beach in Florida is probably not a good idea. I mean, it's beautiful and you know, a lot of good recreation, but yeah. definitely not a safe thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, are you, uh, are you done? Oh, with, sure. Yeah. I don't want to hear about the chimps. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, you know, um, Hugh, uh, I'm sure that you and Kathy, when your boys were young, were, would take your, your kids to the zoo. Oh, yeah. We looked at the chimps. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we, our kids love going to the zoo. And, you know, one of the things that's, that's kind of sad about having our kids grow up is that I love going to the zoo, and now Amy and I don't really have an excuse. Ah, uh, but you got grandkids. <laughs> I, we got grandkids. And so now we're, we we're finding ourselves uh, on zoo excursions, in fact— uh, last summer, my wife ended up taking our grandson on a camel ride, <laughs> so she drew the short straw and had to get up on the camel with her grandson. But, but you know, I loved, I have always loved watching the chimps, mm -hmm. you know, and there's just something fascinating about their behavior. And I think, you know, you even if you watch them for just a few minutes, you get this strong sense that they're intelligent, uh, you know, maybe I might use the word soulful creatures that that have a, a, a rich set of emotions, you know? And when you look at chimps at times, it almost seems like you're, you're getting a glimpse of yourself, right? Well, <laughs> the way they can get into mischief. <laughs> yeah. That's where you really, that's where I get entertained is watch. And they seem to know when they're entertaining you. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, that's certainly the case, you know? Uh, but, you know, w what's interesting is that, you know, the, the the amazement that you and I have as casual observers of chimps is is something that really comes to light in a powerful way when you have primatologists 
really scientifically studying the behavior of chimps. And, you know, in the last decade or so, there's been some remarkable observations of chimps, both in captivity and in the wild. That, and they're doing things that really are, are surprising to some degree. So chimps, you know, everybody I think is aware chimps will make tools to extract termites from nests or to fish algae out of a body of water. They'll make, use rocks to open up nuts and things like that. But they also will have been observed in the wild manufacturing spears to hunt with, right? And, uh, and uh, they've been observed, you know, av using caves to avoid inclement uh, conditions. They, they seem to have an understanding of how to get out of the uh, rough, you know, climactic right, right. situations. They understand wildfire. People have observed them uh, uh, displaying an understanding of how the fire is going to move and they will exploit that to get food, and, you know, the grubs that are exposed as a result of the wildfires burning. They build, uh, you know, uh, beds in, in trees and strategic locations where they can see the predators coming before the predators can see them. And, and then they have these escape routes that they plan. And they use, you know, certain tree branches that have certain tensile properties to build them the beds and their insect repellent. So, you know, remarkable behavior. They've been observed, you know, self-medicating. And of course, I think people are aware that, that they mourn the, the loss of people sure. in, their, in their groups. And so you could look at this behavior and say, wow, this seems like chimps are, are kind of like us, that there's something in their behavior that maybe is an antecedent to our behavior, that they have a capacity for maybe limited abstract thinking and in planning depth and in, in an innovativeness. And there's a couple of other studies that have just been published that seem to add to that, that case. Um, one of them is what um, was uh, just published uh, a few weeks ago. I think it was Current Biology. And they, they reported on the, for the first time on the use of insects, uh, chimps using insects as a way to self-medicate. And they were studying a group of chimps in in a in Gabon, and uh, over the span of about 15 months, they recorded on camera 22 episodes where chimps captured some kind of Chim. bug, and you know put it in its mouth and kind of made a paste of it, and then rubbed that insect paste in open wounds, and three times they observed chimps actually doing that with, to the wounds of another chimp, not just to their own wounds. Now they don't know what the insect is, you know, and and uh, and they don't know if it has medicinal value. But this is another example of self-medication that that's been obser observed in chimps. They use plants uh, to you know parts to rub on their op on wounds, mm -hmm. you know, or areas of their skin that are irritated. They'll consume plants that have no food value, that are bit bitter, that actually have you know, um, medicinal uh, benefits. Medis yeah, particularly, you know, to ward off or to combat pathogens, intestinal pathogens and things like that. And they seem to understand insect repellents. Yes, <laughs> they do. Yeah. So, you know, you know, this again is reflecting some level of, of intelligence in these creatures, you know, that's, that's really, again, you know, something to marvel at. But one of the aspects of the study that was also interesting was the, the claim that because chimps were treating other chimps' wounds, that this is evidence for prosocial behavior in chimps. And, and right now it's controversial among primatologists whether chimps engage in prosocial behavior or not. This study would seem to think or, or, or suggest that they do, where they're engaged in behavior that benefits others without the actor actually deriving any benefit. But are they part of the same social group or is this a different social group? Oh, well, in this case, they would be part of the same social group. But, you know, in this particular paper, the, the authors point out that this is exciting because the evolutionary origin of pro-social behavior is deeply problematic, that there's not a good model to, to explain how social behavior or pro-social behavior originates where, again, there's a type of altruism, you know, because when you think about natural selection, it's all about the, what the, the individual. Yeah. There's a self, an inherent selfishness that you would expect because of natural selection. And so I thought it was interesting that, again, these authors were acknowledging 
that the explaining pro-social behavior is is problematic. And they were excited because if chimps actually are engaged in this, this might give some insight as to how pro-social behavior evolved. Although I would counter that with the, the point that you've not really s solved the problem just because chimps display that behavior. You just have, have displaced the problem <laughs> to another species. Yeah, you still got to figure out where it all started. Yeah, there's, there's no real insight. Uh, but now the, the second study uh, that I thought was interesting was a study done uh, by researchers from the Max Planck Institute of Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig, Germany. And they were interested in uh, the evolutionary origin of, nut, uh, of nutcracking behavior in chimps. And it's interesting because in some groups of chimps, they display nutcracking behavior, others don't. And those groups that uh, they were, st the group that they were studying uh, was uh, found in Guinea, and adjacent to this group, not too far away, was a group that engaged in that cracking behavior, but this particular group did not. And so the question is, are these chimps capable of independently innovating to develop nut cracking behavior, or is this something that is learned through some kind of social uh, uh, transmi transmission of knowledge, right? And so they, they did a, a field study and uh, uh, where they set up four experiments uh, in, the, uh, in the natural habitat of these chimps to, to see if they could stimulate uh, this group to actually develop nutcracking behavior. Things like putting nuts out in the field with a bunch of rocks in the area and see if they pick yeah, it Yeah, exactly. There was, okay. you know, they, they, did, they chose two locations uh, at different times of the year where it was high food abundance, low food abundance. And in one experiment, they laid out um, uh, like uh, I think it was palm nuts and rocks. Another one, they laid out koala nuts and rocks. Uh, they uh, also laid out um, uh, palm nuts, rocks, and then cracked open palm nuts. And then they, uh, the last study, they had palm fruit along with the rocks and the palm nuts. And in none of those instances, they, they recorded over a span of about four years. Well, the, the, the four experiments took four years. And the, over that span, they recorded 35 visits to these sites. And in no instance was there any evidence for uh, nutcracking behavior or even a preamble to nutcracking behavior. And they had, you know, large groups, small groups visit these sites. They had mixed gender groups visit the site, groups that were of similar gender, uh, groups where it was a mix, mixed age, and in no instance was there any kind of, of nutcracking behavior. Occasionally, they might eat, you know, in the experiment where there was palm fruit, you know, they, uh, would, eat the fruit, they yeah. would eat the fruit. But so the, so the researchers conclude that to be able to innovate, nutcracking behavior is a really rare event in chimps. Now, in captivity, people have observed chimps independently innovating tool use but it was would be for poking or pounding or scooping. It wasn't something that was complex where you were using that that to. Uh, well, moreover, in captivity, they get to watch humans. Right. So. Right, and the thought is that really the gold standard would be what happens in the wild. Right. But nobody has observed in captivity nutcracking behavior innovating, so it, it's it seems to be something that occurs rarely. But they argue that once it occurs, it's it's the, there must be some kind of social transmission of that of that knowledge to the next generation in order for that behavior to persist. Now, has there been any speculation that maybe a, a rock falls off of a hill and accidentally cracks open a nut that that might actually give them some say, hey, this this works? Uh, I don't think anybody knows how. How? I'm just wondering if the authors speculate no, along those no, lines. No, no, they, they don't. I yeah. mean, now the authors were actually really excited about this result because they said, well, again, this is evidence for, for learning or for what's called cumulative culture, where you develop a certain knowledge and then you transmit that knowledge to the next generation. And so their argument is that, well, this even makes chimps much more like humans than we originally thought. But there's a lack of innovation. Yes, Exactly. You know, is you know, th this is this is a point that cannot be under, or cannot be overemphasized. Sorry, you know, is that with humans, 
we start with fairly primitive technology and, you know, in short order, we've developed the technology to put people on the moon. Chimps show, even though they have cumulative cultures, show no evolutionary progression in that culture. And in fact, that's the same thing that we've observed for Neanderthals as well. Neanderthals very well may have had cumulative culture, but they their culture was stagnant. Stagnant. In no fact, evidence of innovation. Right. They were were on Earth longer than we've been on Earth, and again show very little evidence for, you know, cultural evolution in that sense. You know, and and so what's the difference? Well, as human beings, we have the capacity for symbolism, and we know how to manipulate symbols. And and so anthropologists are speculating along those lines, and that speculation, you know, um, you know, indicates or supports the idea of, of human exceptionalism, you know, and our capacity for symbolism. You could see as a, a manifestation of the image of God, but but something that's also interesting, and it's not part of this study, but uh, it's something that was published a few years ago, and I wrote a blog on it, uh, uh, and the title of the blog is "Does Animal Planning Undermine Human Exceptionalism?" And in this particular study, uh, the, 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 the scientists looking at the question of chimp behavior and their capacity for problem solving argues that we may be too quick to essentially ascribe the same mental processes to chimps that humans possess. And he pointed out that we know from work on AI systems that associative learning in AI through machine learning and, and you know, in, in training algorithms can actually produce pretty sophisticated behavior, but it's acquired through associative learning. And so he, he argued, could this be the case for chimps? And, and did some simulation studies and showed that in these simulations, he could get chimp that simulated chimps to actually acquire the, the, the type of problem solving capacities that have been observed in captivity and in the wild. So it could be that even though chimps are behaving in this fascinating way, this remarkable way, that it's not actually learning in the way that we learn, or it's not cognition in the way that we engage in higher order cognitive processes, but it may be a fundamentally different type of learning that's associative learning, not uh, flexible planning with open-ended uh, capacity to reason. But for it to really work, they need to be in close social contact with a higher being. Yeah. So where there's a human involved, Yes. And what fascinates me about that, that's a message you see in the book of Job, mm -hmm. is that when we're in a bonded relationship with a higher being, we outperform people that don't have that bonded relationship. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing that in these chimpanzees. Yeah. That yeah. same. Yes. And, you know, and I think your concept of, uh, of animals having soulish behavior is really, really very powerful because, in a sense, that would be you know, uh, the explanation for why chimps are engaged in this incredible behavior, but yet at the same time, why we could see them as being unexceptional in that they lack the image of God, you know, and that human beings who display God's image stand apart from these creatures, even though there may be certain behaviors that we superficially share. Oh, well, you know, Fuzz, you've been talking about how symbolism is a mark of human exceptionalism. I'm also hearing from you that innovation is. Yeah. Because I'm thinking, you know, look, if we look at toddlers and infants, you put a bunch of nuts in front of them with a bunch of rocks, it's within seconds that they're smashing <laughs> open those rocks. <laughs> so it's like innovation is there even at a very early uh, yes. stage in human uh, development. Yeah. Uh, the child may take a little more time to be able to learn their multiplication tables, but the innovation is there right from the very get-go. Yeah, yeah. Now, one other, one other point that I think is important is, you know, again, it relates to, you know, the evolutionary origin of, of, you know, or at least the presumed evolutionary origin of our sophisticated cognitive capacities. You know, uh, there's a tendency when we look at the hominins like Homo habilis, Homo erectus, Neanderthals to, to see kind of an evolutionary origin of, of our behavior because th these creatures seem to have, you know, a little bit more sophisticated behavior as you go from the habilines to the erectines to, you know, creatures like Neanderthals. Uh, uh, but what's happening is we're comparing th their behavior to the behavior of modern humans. But what if we add another point of comparison? 
the, the behavior of chimps. Mm-hmm. Now when we do that, what we see is that at least with Homo erectus and, and, and Homo, hab, hab, uh, Homo habilis, that these creatures are behaving qualitatively the same way as chimps are. And you might even argue that Neanderthals right. are, are more closely aligned with chimp behavior than they are with the behavior of right. modern humans. Right. And so that actually creates a, by incorporating the chimp comparison into that comparison of capabilities, it actually creates a, a bigger gap between humans and Neanderthals than we might necessarily think exists. Well, as you read the scientific literature on this, Fuzz, are you seeing a growing awareness of what I would call anthropomorphism in their interpretations? I mean, just like we tend to put human qualities on our pets, uh, are these researchers actually aware uh, that from their human perspective, they're imputing qualities on these creatures that they really don't possess? Um, many of, many are not. And th- there's a, a really great book written by um, uh, Marion Stamp Dawkins, who is actually Richard Dawkins' first wife. She's a be- behavioralist, animal behavioralist. And I'm drawing a blank on the name of the book. Uh, but she, in this book, argues, she's very much pro-animal rights, but she argues that most animal behavioral studies are plagued with anthropomorphism, where we, we tend to, to ascribe to animals the same mental states that we have right. when we see behavior that seems to echo our behavior. Especially when we have a relationship with these animals. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and so my, my, I think the point you're getting at is that are we anthropomorphizing Neanderthals? Right. Right. You know, uh, and our ability to anthropomorphize actually arises out of our our uh, capacity for theory of mind. In other words, I recognize that you have a mind like mine, and I have this desire to try to to link with your mind, right? And but, figure out what I'm thinking. Right. Yeah. And, and, and what you're feeling. But what happens is we don't know how to turn that off. So we talk about our automobiles as if they were were people. You know, we talk so, about. Do you our have animal. a name for your car? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't. I don't. Uh, you know, but but your even, wife probably does, though. So. <laughs> yeah, but but even like with our pets, right? We we tend to, you know, and and this is part of our ability to bond with animals, with these soul-like right. animals, right? With the soulish animals, which is you know important. So you know, so the you know the question here is again, our, how much anthropomorphism is really influencing? the way we think about these results. So anyway, uh, you know, th- this, you know, what we're presenting here is really just a, a different model for thinking about the remarkable behavior of chimps that preserves the idea of human exceptionalism, but yet allows us to, to really enjoy and appreciate, you know, these incredibly beautiful, marvelous, remarkable creatures and, 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 and see them as part of God's handiwork that, that we should celebrate without feeling threatened that this is somehow undermining, you know, uh, the biblical account of human origins. So take your kids to the zoo or grandkids. And like me, I like to get them out into the wild where they actually get to see the creatures yeah. in their wild environment. Yeah, but, p- but people frown upon putting kids in the, in the, the, the animal displays. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so you don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah, and when I take my boys out into the wild, I try to make sure, hey, yeah. uh, I want to know where the grizzlies are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, uh, Fuzz, you've written a lot of articles on uh, these bipedal primates and chimps and humans. Where can people find this stuff? How, what's the easiest way yeah. for them to get access? Well, you know, the, the, um, I would recommend um, the book Who is Adam as a, a starting point. Mm-hmm. But if you go to our to our website, reasons.org, and just search chimps or search Neanderthals or hominins or hominids, you're going to find, You'll find all that a, a stuff. collection of articles that you know, we've written over time that kind of fleshes out you know, some of the points that we're making here today. Very good. Well, I think we've, we've done all the damage we're going to be able to do today, Hugh. So uh, I just want to say thank you to everybody for watching this episode. Please tell people about it. Uh, share it you know, on your social media. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Reasons to Believe, or to set the reminder. And then, of course, you can follow us on social media, RTB underscore official. Yeah, and you answer questions on your social media. And so do you. Right. right? And so if people you know, want to pose questions or get into conversations, 
And also in the comments of this video, if there are, are questions you have or discoveries that you think might be fun for us to talk about, you know, please uh, put that in the comments. We'll definitely take a look at it and consider your suggestions. And of course, last but not least, uh, we would really want people to visit our website at reasons.org and, and make available to themselves uh, the incredible wealth of resources we have. Very good. Until next time, remember, the, the more that we discover about science, the more that we have reasons to believe. Amen to that. <laughs>